Cool enough in here for you. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'm glad it's 70 degrees today. I'm glad for the heat. And by the way, Dave Kleinite, the guy who gave the announcement, uh, he is a landscaper extraordinaire, and he has been working outside. If you haven't noticed, if you drive, when you drive away today, just look around at our campus here, and it's been beautified uh, many, many ways. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And he's pulling out the old, and this should be there, and this should be gone, and this should be in, and all this type of stuff. And so it's going to continue to grow and be beautiful. And if you would be so kind, I'm going to just bring an emphasis on that, uh, next week, 25 yards of mulch. And so if you're here, it doesn't take a whole lot of skill, it does take some muscle uh, to come out there and do that or plant some things in the ground to give him a boost, to give this campus a boost. And if you can come out and make a difference here, that would be fantastic. Just put it in your mind next Saturday uh, in the morning from. 9 to 12, right? Or 8 to 12. 8 to 12. And uh, that would be great. And if you like watering things and keeping them alive, we want to talk to you because we're going to look for your assistance there as well. So, all right. Well, this time we're going to dismiss the kids. So kids, you are free to roam about the country. So go on out. Go to the back. Head to the left. Go downstairs. Lots of kids down there as well. So glad that we have kids with us and lots of children's workers that help us out as well. By the way, uh, thank you to Jennifer and Jennifer leading us this morning. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. Uh, really, we have really gifted people here and the team, of course. Uh, Rob does work another job. So he works. Rob Petrie, who is typically right here, uh, is our uh, regular worship leader, per se. Uh, he is at Beloit College this morning. That's his other job. And uh, they have their graduation today. And so he has to be there running their sound, doing their tech stuff. So he at least misses one time a year. And this is that Sunday. And so next week, and I see you there, Dr. Bob. Why don't you wave to us here right in the middle. This is Dr. Bob Griffin right there. There's another Dr. Bob behind him, actually. Two Dr. Bob's right in a row. That was a good time right there. Okay, so, <laughs> so next week I'm going to a graduation, and we are, of course, in the midst of a series on prayer, and he has led, Bob Griffin here, has led... Um, uh, Rockford Renewal Ministries in our concert of prayers in this community for at least 20 years, maybe 30, 40. Can I get 50? Yeah, okay, we'll do a little auction. But he, he's led us for a long time. He's written a book on revival, which is here. And I've asked him to come speak to us uh, next week about prayer and probably revival or what have you, whatever's on his heart. So please come out for that. It's going to help us move the ball forward, so to speak, when we're looking at... Oh, down it goes. And when we're looking at the... Uh, the, the issue of, of prayer. Okay, and so thank you, uh, gentlemen and a scholar. Thank you so much. I am clumsy. So, okay, and so before we jump into the message, I've asked Eric Fish, come on up, Eric. Um, each week, I'm trying to bring a testimony to us of prayer working, I was making a difference in the lives of people. And just last week, he was talking about taking me up on the challenge, if you remember, the first Sunday of the month, talking about Luke chapter 11 and praying the Lord's Prayer. I said, hey, will you pray with me every morning that prayer there? And so I've been doing it. Eric's been doing it. He said, hey, let me tell you how it's impacted me. I said, Eric, why don't you come on up and share that? So we're going to have him go before the message. We're having communion at the end of the message. And so come on up, Eric. Here you go. Give a warm welcome to Eric Fish. <laughs> Good morning, guys. We're on, right? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. You know, about, about 10 years ago, I had one brother, and then Jesus saved me. I not, now I have all these brothers and sisters. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's an honor and privilege to be up here today to speak to all of us uh, especially about prayer because it's really our lifeline to the Lord and uh, without prayer I mean there's a pastor I heard once say uh, little prayer equals little power much prayer brings us much power no prayer well no power and uh, but I talked to Dave on the phone like he was saying uh, a few days ago and uh, I've got a busy schedule. I was growing weary, like a lot of people who are on the work staff right now and working. I'm on mandatory overtime, and I've been getting weary and tired, and then they're adding more hours, and it's been extra busy. And then Dave puts out the challenge to get up earlier. 
So me in the flesh was like, oh, yeah, no, this ain't going to work. You know, this is not going to happen. And so I, uh, I uh, but then you know how the Lord works, convicts us. I thought I'd give it a shot. And I started getting up earlier. And what really struck me was the hallowed be thy name. The glory to God. You know, I come in and I pour out my request all the time. You know, God, help me here. Give me this. Give me that. Give me this. Change her. Change him. Change my boss. Change this. But hallowed be thy name changes everything. There's been times I wake up and I want to, I'm praying, oh, my, we, my wife and I may have gotten into something the day before, and I'm thinking about that first thing in the morning, and I start to pray, God, can you do this in her? Can you do that in her? And all of a sudden, the Lord starts to intercede on God's behalf and I, he starts to tell me what have I already done and I start to thank him for the great work he's done in here she gave her testimony two weeks ago or two months ago I'm sorry and uh, and there was a lot of prayer behind that and I start to thank him about what's changed in my life, in my marriage, in my family. But most of all, what he's done. You know, we can't forget, I guess, the magnitude of our God, the creator of all heavens and earth, seen and unseen, things that he's done in our lives. You know, he's the God of the angel armies. He's the God who turns nothing into something, recreates us. Gives us a new heart. He's the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is a good shepherd, Abba Father, and in so many other great things that he is. And when you come into that stance in the morning as who he is, and see the magnitude of his goodness, his glory, his greatness. It starts to change everything in your day. My wife said, Eric, your day must be going a lot smoother now. I can tell, you know, she can see I'm run down, my expressions. We've been together for 20-some years, so she can tell if something's going wrong in a second. And she goes, oh, things must be going better at the job. The fact is I've been getting up earlier in honoring and worshiping him. We can get up early to catch a flight. We can get up early to make a doctor's appointment. We can get up early to meet with a friend. We can get up early for all these other things. So my encouragement is to get up just a little bit for the one that wakes us up, the one that gives us life. Uh, so another thing with Dave and these messages that he lays before the Lord uh, we need to know that this is a word from God. And how do we know that? It's because he backs it up with his word. And it's so important to see how powerful and impactful it can be when he gives us some type of, uh, what's the word, some type of challenge that we go forth in that. He puts a lot of sweat and tears into this body. But, of course, the blood is reserved only to the lamb who was slain. Uh, so I wanted to read a scripture quick here. It's in Luke. Let's see. Now this scripture really isn't usually affiliated with prayer, but it's in Luke chapter 17, 11 through 19. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled among, along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and call, called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw... When he saw he was healed, came back praising God, one of them, in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. 
and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made me well. So that's 90%. How many times has God healed us? How many times has God done things in our lives? And we don't acknowledge the one who did it. I'm guilty. Guilty as charged. Many times he's healed me. Many times he's delivered me. Many times he's done these things. Yet we fail to give him thanks. Uh, I read this one time uh, before. It says, what if all you had today is what you thanked God for yesterday? What if that's all we had? Uh, so when my wife gave her testimony two months ago, uh, there was a little disclaimer, you know, she battled addiction with drinking. She battled different things and these demons that cut, were coming into our marriage. We were unevenly yoked for a while. And uh, we met with Pastor Dave and Pastor Dave, uh, they, the, the sessions didn't go well. And it was like maybe our second or third session, I think my wife left, and I was sitting there with Dave, and uh, Dave said, well, all we can do now is pray. It's all we can do. And I went onto this website, and I found believers all over the world. And I reached out to people in South Africa, in Amsterdam, and, and I just told them to pray for my marriage, pray for my marriage, pray for my marriage, pray for my marriage. I was in desperate need of a Savior in my marriage. I had to be patient in affliction, like Dave was preaching on last week. But he's so mighty to save, mighty in battle. Our marriage is just, it's not the same. There's not a God added to what we have. There's a God that's in the centerpiece. He's the theme. He's, the, he's everything. He's a redeemer, a restorer, a healer. I have a few other examples of just people that I've come across. Sister Annette, we have a Bible study with Fish Abel. And Sister Annette came. I called her up. She's in the hospital. She couldn't walk. And I talked to her on the phone. And I said, Sister Annette, uh, I was just wondering, uh, how are you doing? She goes, I can't even walk. And I said, well, Sister Annette, uh, I'll be praying for you. So we'll be praying for you at the Bible study. She goes, wait a second. We serve a God that performs miracles. I believe I'm going to be there Friday. And here she was in the hospital, couldn't walk. And there she was. She, she ended up coming that, that Friday as a testimony of her faith that she was there. Uh, my niece, she came to our Bible study once when we were having it at the house. And she came in there. She couldn't get pregnant. She was married and couldn't get pregnant. Time and time they had practiced for... They were trying to have a child. So we prayed for her at my house. All these believers laying hands on her, praying for her. And she had a son named Joseph. He comes and sits with my wife once in a while. And now he's got a sister. Sister Tanya, she was in a wheelchair. She was blind and she was crippled and she was on dialysis. And her back was against the wall and so many afflictions physically. And she said, when I went blind, I had to trust the people that God put me around. So I had to pray to God so that I could trust those people he brought me around. I had to live by faith, not by sight. And she goes, but God knew that he had to allow me to be blind or I'd be ripping and roaring down these streets. Then she goes, and then when I was in this wheelchair, you know, I just... I had to just rest in him and trust in him and for those who pushed me and who were the people that were taking me places. But now that I'm in this stretcher, 
I realize that God has been carrying me, carrying me all along. That was her perspective. Every type of affliction, she knew it was for her good because she loved him. The first time we had our fi first fish abled event, uh, I'll stop here, but the first time we were going to have our fish abled event, uh, Sister Deborah told me I'm going to lay it before the Lord because we needed to get a bus so we could start our mission to take people with disabilities out, to start taking them to church and Bible studies and getting them out to fellowship. And, but we needed to get a bus. So she laid it before the Lord, and after that, that uh, fundraiser, I said, Deborah, you should have been there that night. It was over capacity. There's just so many people. My, my grandpa was running the door, and they told him, oh, there's too many people. He goes, I'm running the door here. And he kept letting more and more people come, more and more people come. And so it was to capacity, and I told Deborah, Deborah, I can't believe this. You'll never believe how many people were there. We, wait, we raised more than we expected. We can get a bus now. And she said, what do you mean you don't believe that happened? What do you mean? Faith is such an important part. We can't please God without it. And I just want to thank you guys for uh, listening to some of the things that God is doing, not just with me, but all of us. But really take to heart that there is a God who watches over us. He will never leave us, never forsake us. And he is for us. So if he's for us, who can be against us? Thank you for this time. You don't know Eric. He is... Uh... <laughs> He's an evangelist at heart, but really loves people. And uh, his daytime job, <laughs> maybe consider being a preacher, but his, uh, his daytime job is driving a paratransit bus, and he's been doing that for decades now. And so the, the organization called Fish Abled was launched out of God's heart, placed on his heart to say, hey, why don't you do something for folks that just typically just go to the doctor. And so out of that is a ministry that has literally reached hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and so we're happy to park the buses out here which continue to get catalytic converters stolen from them <clears throat> and i'm not kidding by the by the way if you have a spot for some buses we have some buses for you that need a home because they keep getting uh, vandalized uh, but anyway thank you for that word thank you for praying and thank you for the encouragement so okay so if i asked you um to pray for the church how would you pray? That's the question we are looking at this morning. And the truth is that the church can only rise as high as, high as the tide of our prayers take it. Let's let that sink in. The church can only rise as high as the tide of our prayers take it. So this morning we're going to look at a text that will give us three things to thank God for, coupled with three things to ask God for. That's where we're going this morning. Please open up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're going to look at two verses, 3 and 4, and then I'm going to couple them with two other verses, 11 and 12. And so I'm asking you to pray these things when you pray for the church. We've talked about Jesus' prayer. We've talked about various aspects, and we will continue to do that. And the hope is that from this series that you and I will be equipped with some very practical things to pray, right, from Scripture, that we would grow in our faith and we see God really working and moving. Now, in the past, I've talked about these um, chapters. We did a series in First and Second Thessalonians, but we're looking at this passage through a lens of prayer. So I'm going to read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, verses 1 and 2. Paul gives us an introduction and then jumps into some things. And I want you to notice three things from this in which I'm wanting us to pray for and ask God for. So here we go. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so. 
because your faith is growing more and more. And the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all of the persecutions and trials you are enduring. So did you catch the three things that I'm asking us as a congregation, and Paul also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, asks us to give thanks for? Number one, the first one is this. Thank God that faith is growing. Now the truth is that faith is growing in this place. And that is one part of our mission statement, that we would grow in the obedience of faith. So we, and if you've been around here for a year or a couple years, talked about this place being a greenhouse in which the seed of God's word is planting and planted in the soil of our hearts. And then this place would be an incubator, a greenhouse, so to speak, in which God's word through faith will grow in our hearts. And so one of the primary things that I'm asking you to give thanks for and pray for for this congregation, and that is that our faith would grow. Regardless if you've just become new to faith or you've been in faith for 50, 60, 70 years, each of us can continue to grow in our faith. And so when you pray for this congregation, and I want you, and I'm asking you, to pray that faith would continue to grow everywhere, in every heart, in every place in this congregation, because this is God's desire for us. Second, that, that we would thank God that love is increasing. Now this is not love for God, which we want that to increase as well. But this is primarily, as you look at the text, love for one another is increasing. Every human on this planet has been designed, uh, designed and desires love. And we can say amen to that. Everyone in this room, okay, everyone outside of this place has been designed and desires to be loved. Now why is that? Well, that is in God's heart because one of God's essential qualities, and he has many, is love. Okay. He created us for a relationship. The Trinity has always been in relationship eternally. So we are created for love. And Paul thanks God that in that congregation and also in this congregation that love would be increasing. God's glory is seen in our love for him, yes, but also our love for one another. You guys understand how diverse this congregation is? Okay. It is diverse. We have people who live in various places throughout the city. We have people who have different educational backgrounds and different uh, income backgrounds. We have people who have different skin tones and speak different languages. The testimony of God's working among us in this church and in churches is that we love one another. And the more diverse we are, and the more similar we are in the sense of God's faithfulness and faith in our hearts, and we love one another, is a massive testimony to the world. People will know that we are Christians because... You know the answer. Our love. Not because we carry Bibles. Not because we have little fish bumper stickers. Not because we attend a service in a place at a certain time. It's because of love. So I want you, and I'm asking you to pray, that we would love one another deeply, intentionally, from the heart. And this is demonstrated in this room, yes, but more so outside of this space. Phone calls, visits, follow-ups, 
sharing of resources, sharing of time in prayer, in tears, in laughter, in connection. So pray that we love one another and our love for one another increases. So when you pray for this place, thank God. And I thank God that faith is increasing, and it is. I also thank God that love is increasing, and it is. We want to see these things more and more. Thirdly, from this passage, thank God that people are persevering. Did you catch that in the last part of these verses? Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions, trials you are enduring. Paul prayed not that the persecutions and trials would stop. Did you catch that? What he prayed for is that we would persevere in the midst of difficulty. You and I have persevered. You are here, some of us, up to 95 years, persevering. And we all in this room have seen some stuff, right? We have seen some stuff. And yet you still have faith, and yet you still believe, and yet you are still here, persevering in trials, in difficulty, and some of us in acute persecution. And yet you continue moving forward. It is not how you start that matters, but how you finish. Right? So let us finish strong. Let us start strong. Let us continue to spur one another to love and good deeds. And let's finish well. Your and I's story is not over. We still have time yet to come on this planet and then we will have the veil torn and we'll see the real reality. So we need to continue to pray and thank God that there will be perseverance of faith in this place. God does use trials. He uses difficulties. And in those things, we are proved or we're improved. Okay, I've talked about this in the past, right? So let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's plant hope with one another. And let's love each other well. So three things right from these verses, okay? That we will thank God that faith is growing. We will thank God that love is increasing. And we'll thank God that we are persevering through trials. And I want you to thank God when you pray for this congregation about those things. And I want you to pray this way, okay, for us, that these will continue to happen. So let's pause right now and pray for these three things. So God, here we are. Now we prayed for this morning. We pray continually that your spirit would be seen among us. God, I am grateful, Lord, that faith is growing in this place. And there is a legacy of faith that we are benefiting from. God, I ask that each one of us, regardless if we're new to faith, or we've been in faith for a long time, God, that we would grow, that our minds would be sharpened, our heart will be enlightened, your word will be planted in our hearts, God. Put your quote-unquote miracle growth, so to speak, in our hearts, that faith would grow. God, I thank you. God, that love is in this house. God, we pray and we thank you that this is true and that it would grow and increase that we love each other deeper and better and stronger, God. And that this place would be oozing with your love that would be attractional and irresistible, God. That we would say, oh, we love to be here because there is love in the house. Help us in that. Open our hearts to that, to one another. Thirdly, God, we, we ask... Father, that we would persevere in the faith. God, that those who are even struggling today, God, would see a glimmer of hope from what is shared by Eric, by myself, from a conversation in the hallway, from hearing 
words, God, that you would permeate and empower our hearts, Lord, to persevere in what we believe in the midst of difficulties. God, may we be overcomers, God, because your Spirit's in us. And we thank you that these things are happening in this space. In Jesus' name, amen. That's the first section. And now as you read and you read in 2 Thessalonians, okay, these verses that I've, I've, I've put aside talking about God vindicating and validating, talking about what God's working in those that were facing, uh, the Thessalonians were uh, connected to and being persecuted by. So you can read that there. And then we're going to jump down to verses 11 and 12. And in this now, Paul is praying for them. So he's thanking God for things that were occurring. And I want you to thank God as you pray for Crosspoint. This church, you can expand that to the churches in Rockford. But if you are a part of this church, I'm asking you to start to pray or pray more about this church, these three things, okay? And then thank God for these. And then we see three things that Paul himself prays for the church. And I want us to pray for these. And these are dense I'm going to take a drink here. 2 Thessalonians, verses 11 and 12. Now look for things in this passage that we, and I'm asking you to pray for. So here we go, verse 11. With this in mind. This is how God is working, what he is grateful for. With this in mind, we, which was Paul and his companions, constantly... Pray for you. Well, what are they praying? Number one, that our God may make you worthy of his calling. And that by his power, he may bring to fruition your your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Verse 12. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is profound. This is dense. This is meaningful and powerful. And I'm asking you to pray this way for this congregation. First thing we see in this passage, pray that we will walk worthy of His calling. And notice this isn't walking worthy of your calling. Okay? You are called, equipped, fashioned to make a difference for Christ in this world. Okay? You are called. And I know this from Scripture. Ephesians 2 will talk about this in so many other places. This is praying to God that we would live out Christ calling to us. One of the things I love about Christ is he was not some weak-willed wuss, okay? He was a man on a mission. When he spoke, things happened, and his invitation was meaningful and it was powerful. And as he was fulfilling his calling... He went from place to place, and as he was calling people, he said, Come, follow me. And then he kept on walking. His calling, number one, for each one of us, is to follow him. So we need to pray that God would help us follow his son Jesus well, right? That we would have heard it been preached, being, be covered in the dust of our rabbi, right? Be so close to him. 
That when people look to him, we just look beyond his shoulder, and there you and I are following him. So the primary important thing for us to follow Jesus is to see him, right? We would see where he's going. We see what he's saying. We see what he's doing. And we desire to be close to him. This isn't you figuring out what to do today. This isn't you being empowered to do things. And this is the next thing. But this is us being close to him. We are the body of Christ. And you say, well, amen to that, right? He is gone. He is in heaven. Scripture says interceding for us. We are his body because his spirit is in us. So we have to pray, God, help us us to walk worthy of your calling. And I want you to think about that. What is Christ's calling? What is worthy of that calling? And God, will you give us grace to do that? If you try to follow Christ in your own strength, you'll be called and you will be a Pharisee. You'll just be religious, right? Trying to fulfill righteousness in the flesh by your own strength. That stinks, right? This is, God, will you give me ears to hear? Will you give me that grace? God, will you give me a mouth to speak? Will you give me that grace? God, will you give me a mind that is open? God, will you give me a heart that will treasure your word here? We need God's grace to do this and a will to say, God, help me to walk worthy of your calling. Will you pray that for us as a congregation? That each one of us would exemplify God's grace as we look to magnify God's Son. This is a powerful Prayer. And this is the prayer that the Holy Spirit asked Paul to pray. And I'm asking you to pray it yourself. Now the next thing we see in this passage is quite fun, honestly. And this is the principle. Pray that we will be empowered to achieve... <laughs> this is interesting. Our desires and deeds. Did you see that in verse 11? Bring up that verse if you would, please. Verse 11, you can just go back to that. That'll be fantastic, right? Yeah, there it is. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling. We just talked about this. This is the second thing. And... By his power, this is the empowerment, by God's power, God may bring to fruition, that means to be achieved, be accomplished, your, (laughs) catch this, your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. That's pretty incredible. So the prayer is that God would empower us. That God would empower you. Okay? Empower us for what? Well, a desire we have. Right? A desire for what? Desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. So the prayer is that God would empower us to fulfill our desires for goodness in this church, in the community, in your home, in your work, in your school, in your family. And hopefully you have desires for goodness there. And also our deeds, our every deed prompted by faith. This is fun, right? This is, I have a desire to help pastors in Africa. God, will you empower us to do that? And he is. 
This is a desire to make a difference for people who just ride buses from one place to another. God, my desire is that they would know you and have community. God, will you empower us to see this happen? Are you understanding the potential in this passage? So what are your desires for goodness? What are your deeds that you want to see accomplished because of your faith? These are good things. And I want to stir up your spirit's imagination. God, what could happen in my family, in my home, in my workplace, in my situation? God, I love to do this, that, or the other thing, prompted by your faith. This is to glorify God. God, what is here? And then we pray, God, will you empower us to do these things? Is that a good prayer? hundred percent. And so I want you to stir up in your mind, right? Stir up some things in your heart. What are some of my desires that are good? What are some of the deeds I want to see accomplished in this world? Stir those up and then pray that God would empower those desires and deeds by His Spirit so that we could see those achieved. I want to see more godly dreams in this place fulfilled. We say amen right there. Come on, right? So let's pray for this, right? Let's pray for this and see what God would do among us. Right? It's not going to happen if we aren't empowered by His Spirit. And if we're not going to be empowered by His Spirit if we don't have the desires. And we won't have those desires if we don't make room for them in God's grace. Are you hearing me? Right? Start dreaming. Start scheming, so to speak, in a godly sense. And we're going to pray. God, empower these things. And let's see what happens. I don't know. He can do above and beyond. I can ask or imagine. And I have a pretty strong imagination. God, do that. So will you pray this? Pleading with you. Pray this. Thirdly, on this list, pray that we will glorify God. Jesus, and we will be glorified in Him. We exist to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. This is why we are here as a congregation. I have Cross Point t shirts, and I have Cross Point golf shirts, and I have cross point coats and I have cross point hat but ultimately I am not here to promote cross point I'm here to promote the cross which is the point right we're here to glorify Christ that's the ultimate goal a thousand years from here, more than likely, this place won't exist anymore. I'm assuming Christ will come back by then, but I could be wrong. What matters is Christ and glorifying Him. So we pray that God would glorify Himself. Jesus would be glorified in this place. Churches get off track when they're trying to glorify their name, and pastors get off track when they try to glorify their name, right? And we see churches go to the wayside. We see pastors fall because the ministry becomes more about the man versus the man, okay? It's a problem. So pray that Jesus will be glorified in this place, right? He will be glorified here and we will be glorified in him. Isn't that curious? Right? That at the end, when we are singing for 10,000 
years, right? Thank you for leading in this. Then he says, well done. Well done, well done, well done. Again, it's not that we are resurrecting power in ourselves, that we're opening our hearts up to God and say, God, I want to follow you in the obedience of faith because of your great grace. Right? And God says he will glorify you and say, well done, well done. So we say, God, will you show your glory in us as we follow you and glorify your Son? God reflects his goodness and rewards his children. We, God will praise us in the end. This is 1 Peter 1, 7, for glorifying him. So we pray that Christ will be glorified in this place. It's not about a space. It's not about money. It's not about a man. It's not about a name. It's about the name, the place, his provision. Okay. And so pray these things, please. I made a little card, and it is not as good as Corey's card. It looks like a three-year-old put it together, okay? It's in the back. I tried. I'm terrible. That's why we pay other people to do this stuff, right? But again, it's just a little card and it's out there, right? I'm asking us to pray about this. I'm asking us to really put ourselves into this. Here they are again and I'm going to pray. Pray that we walk worthy of his calling. Pray that we are empowered to achieve our desires and deeds. Pray that we will glorify Jesus and he and we will be glorified in him. If we see these two things divided into three categories happen in this place, that's a miracle. Our lives will be changed. This community will be blessed. The world will be reached. So thank God, right, and pray that we love each other, that faith would increase, we continue to persevere. Pray that we would live a life worthy of his calling on us. Pray that God would empower our deeds and our desires. Pray that we would glorify Christ in this place and that we would be glorified in him. So God, here we are, Lord. Gathered around your word. Gathered in this place. Gathered together. We pray, Father, that you would live inside of us your life and that we, we would walk worthy of your calling of us. Empower us, God. Encourage us. Help us. Save us, God. We're asking for your help and God, may we as a congregation live this way. When we're together, absolutely. And when we are scattered, absolutely. Both gathered and scattered. God, that we would live a life worthy of your calling because you are worthy of all praise. God, we pray, Lord. God, I am asking that you would empower each of us by your presence. That you would stir up our godly imagination desires for goodness, God. Perhaps some of these have been latent. It's been in, in our hearts for decades. God, I ask that we see those things accomplished. God, we pray that you would help our deeds. God, you would empower us. We don't have the strength. We don't have the means, but we're asking for your power to do that. Will you do that in this place in every person's heart who is here. God, I ask that you would help us always focus in on what we're about for the sake of your name, glorifying you, Lord Jesus. May that be the testimony of this congregation at, at every time, God, that we would be about ultimately glorifying you in our 
processes, in our products, in our plans, in our programs, in our prayers, all of these things, God. Help us to remain focused, God, in it, Lord, when we are gathered in front of your throne, that your glory would be evidenced because you share it. You say, well done, my good and faithful. And God, help us in that. Forgive us when we fall short. Lord, empower us. Bless us. Glorify your name in this place and help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.